to negotiate to a, to a peaceful conclusion. And there were tactical people who uh, wanted to just go ahead and, and raid the place. And, and very early on, the suggestion was made that they should, should use tear gas to force them out. And that, that was rejected by the new Attorney General, Janet Reno. This happened just as Bill Clinton was beginning his first term as president in 1993. And Janet Reno had just been named Attorney General, overseeing the FBI. So you had sort of a novice team at the top dealing with this, but she rejected that out of hand in the, early, in the early days because of the threat to the children. There were probably 30 or some, maybe more children out there. You can Google the numbers on that, but uh, she felt like it was too much of a risk. And the behavioralists really held on for a long time. Um, maybe halfway or so through the standoff, a Houston attorney named Dick DeGuerin came up uh, so he'd been hired to represent Vernon Howell, David Koresh, and was allowed to go inside. And what he came out to say was that Koresh and peacefully once David had completed his analysis of the seven seals in the book of Revelation. <coughs> as, as, I, as I read it later, if you successfully open the seven seals, you precipitate uh, the end of, of time, essentially. So maybe leaving him to do that was not an entirely good idea, but he never got to finish because the pressure from the tactical folks increased. And at the same time, it, it, it had almost a comical quality to it. And it, the, the mighty federal government was unable to coax some coops out of a home in the middle of Texas. Uh, the agency was taking a lot of heat. Uh, people were demanding to know why this was dragging on. Policymakers were feeling pressured. And as we're approaching the 51st day, Janet Reno, who had rejected the use of tear gas out of hand at the beginning, agreed to it. And so on the morning of April 19th, um, using armored vehicles, the FBI began to inject powdered tear gas into the building, which is no great problem to do because it was just kind of a flimsy structure. Poked holes in the side of the walls, injected this, this powder tear gas, which is not explosive. And that went on all morning and nothing much happened other than that. And then right about noon on the 19th, a few minutes into our noon show, a flicker of flame appeared in the corner of an upper floor or roof. And I mentioned earlier, this was not a well-constructed building, and it was kind of drafty. And there was a stout wind blowing that out. And it's like blowing on a campfire. That The flames spread through that building with disturbing rapidity. It was, it was almost frightening to watch. And the building burned to the ground. And just a handful of people escaped. We had been told through a Washington reporter that we worked with that FBI in Washington, and this is, remember, everybody's communicating in real time on this at the federal level. The raid commanders, the scene commanders here are talking directly to their people on, who were in the field along with their superiors in Washington. It's all real time simultaneous communication. And the Washington FBI saw was talking to were saying that 20 or 30 Davidians had escaped out the back of the building, uh, which we could not see from our position. But as it had happened, we'd send a photographer to go find the backside position. And he was actually talked his way onto the deck of the house at Trading House Lake. Uh, it had straight on view of the rear of the compound. Um, far enough away that you couldn't see a lot but with the telescopic lens, you can get a sense of the building. But when it was all said and done, I can't remember the exact number, but there were just a handful of people that escaped. And certainly not 20 or 30 out the back. And at the time, I just assumed that was bad information. But subsequent to that, that make me wonder. First, we, we were very cautious in archiving all of the video that we shot throughout the course of the 51-day standoff. Uh, 
completely comprehensive. You got rid of nothing, even if it was just minor movements. And the one video that turned up missing in the immediate aftermath of the fire on the 19th was the video shot by the photographer who was uh, on the deck of the house looking at the back of the building. Uh, that was a little weird. And then later on, I, I had an opportunity to work a little bit with a document, documentary maker out of Colorado named Mike McNulty, who produced a, uh, ultimately a film called uh, Waco Rules of Engagement. And it's kind of a point of view thing. It, he had an agenda. Um, it was, but he was able through the Federal Freedom of Information Act to, to, to acquire what's called forward-looking infrared video or flitter video from aircraft that were overflying the compound on the day of the raid. And if you look at the documentary, you'll see this, but uh, he's got a stretch of video that really does appear to show a bunch of people coming out of the back of that building and armored vehicles moving up to force them back in. I don't know absolutely whether that's 100% uh, what we're seeing there, but uh, it was enough to raise is my hat. During the course of the standoff, a dozen or more children were allowed to come out. Some of the older members came out. Um, the children were, were kept together initially. And test of that was ever made public. I did later learn that uh, the people that tested the kids found them to be perfectly normal. They were well adjusted. They had no, subtraction, no signs of abuse. Uh, they were attending school. They were able to do things appropriate to their age. Uh, they had grown up in a uh, setting without indoor plumbing and, and some of the amenities that most kids have, but uh, they were certainly in a way abused. Um, and several of the, the, the younger members eventually came out as well, and I think ultimately maybe nine or ten of them were tried and convicted on various charges. All of them have served their prison sentences, and all of them were free. The, the saga continued for us for a long time, though, because we were named along with the Tribune Herald of the lawsuit. It essentially alleged that we had orchestrated this shootout in order to boost circulation and ratings. Uh, that was the essence of the suit. And the claim was that we, Channel 10, had conspired with David Koresh, uh, to provide him with information that this was coming in order to come up with a great story, which was bullshit. It was not true. Uh, but the federal judge who was a son case, who was on the bench here, was no friend of the media, unfortunately. And he granted summary judgment to the agents. And in it said that the behavior of the media was egregious, with which I would take strong issue. Um, in fact, the, I think the behavior of the media was pretty responsible. But it, this, this whole thing gives rise to some significant issues about the First Amendment and about the freedom of, of publication and freedom of press. Uh, there is sort of an, an implicit right in the First Amendment. It's not stated, uh, and, and it's the right to gather news. Government may not interfere with the publication, but uh, this particular situation is a very good example of the kind of situation where there, there really should exist a right to gather news. Um, all we had done was to put people in the neighborhood, as the Trib did, of the compound that morning in anticipation of a law enforcement action. And like Pavlov's dogs, we, we evade uh, the sorts of limits we normally would encounter if we were to do that in a city. If the Waco Police Department were to conduct a major drug raid and we were somehow not part of it, uh, we would have gotten as close as they would have let us get. And that was what was missing on the Feb morning of February 28th was any kind of law enforcement presence. You would think for a large scale, heavily armed law enforcement action that you would want to close off roads in the immediate area of the scene of that, but nobody did that. So we self-positioned, we self-limited ourselves. Uh, 
um, which I thought was 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 the race the right thing to do, and did not in fact pull into that compound behind those raid teams until they were waved on because I think they were expecting a favorable outcome. So ultimately, we lost that judgment, and in federal suits like that, you have to uh, put up the cash award in some kind of escrow in order to appeal, and that would have entailed selling TV stations and newspapers. So at that point, the insurance company said settle or we're or, or out of here, so it was settled. And those questions were never resolved. But they linger to this day. <clears throat> the other the other aspect of this story that I mentioned at the beginning, and, and it's to understand as a consumer of news or as a producer of news, is is, is how how narratives are framed. In this case, the feds spoke alone. Uh, the Davidians, outside of a, one radio interview on the night of the twenty eighth, had no contact with outside media. They dangled a couple of signs from an upper store building, uh, upper store window once or twice, but uh, we didn't know who they were. We didn't know what they looked like. We didn't know what their circumstances yeah, were. And ultimately, we had no idea what their point of view was on any of this. Uh, they might very reasonably have said that they felt like they were under attack that morning and responded in kind. And they might have been able to make a good case for that. But as this thing played out, these were faceless folks. They didn't have names other than Koresh, maybe a couple of his top people. They did, uh, other than those uh, that appeared in a documentary that an Australian TV network had shot about this group. Um, as a Maria, the Davidians were people inside a building we could not see. And what we knew of them was what the federal agents had to say about them, which was pretty consistently praised, armed, dangerous, to threat to the people or in the community around uh, the area, uh, none of which was probably true. But the feds defined the story early. Some reporters balked at that mostly. On this day, uh, in the minds of a lot of people, a bunch of religious crazies burned up in a fire they started themselves, which is also debatable. Uh, the federal narrative on that was that they used all incendiary tear gas rounds. Uh, and they maintained that position for two or three years uh, until we confronted them with uh, recovered incendiary round casings and, and the crates they came in that a source provided us uh, the cleanup of the site. And it was another year or two before uh, they finally did publicly acknowledge that they ran out of powdered tear gas that morning on the 19th and called to the state prison units in Gatesville for, for, for rounds that were delivered that were incendiary. And those are rounds that have a history of setting fires. Uh, they're explosive rounds. So, uh, there's ignition and there's a history uh, through the 60s and 70s, particularly during a lot of the, the civil unrest and race riots and anti-war movement activity of, of these kinds of rounds, uh, setting fire to buildings in which people died. So uh, that, that sort of gave us some reason to begin to question the official account that the video set the fire themselves. Um, but all of this pretty much remains unresolved. The, the, the suits against us were not adjudicated. Uh, suits that Davidian survivors later filed against the federal government were never adjudicated. Um, none of this was, was ever played out in public. There was a congressional hearing. Uh, the Society of Professional Journalists uh, did a report on it. That did not find fault with us being there covering it, but did find fault, and I think probably legitimately with our failure to keep up with this group uh, over the years. Uh, and, and, and that's a valid criticism. Um, 25th anniversary of all this was in 2018, and, and Paramount produced a sort of docudrama about it that in places was reasonably accurate and in other places wasn't. But the lines that this TV station in particular and news media in Waco generally have been blamed uh, 
uh, for the last almost 30 years now for, for what happened there. And although some more knowledgeable writers have, have challenged that in various publications, that's the myth that persists. And that's how defining narrative works. Uh, if you're a news consumer, check, pay attention to the sort of information that you're, you're, you're getting and, and what motive that source might have for writing it in a certain way. And if your star sees the moment and, and, and frame, it, frame the narrative yourself before somebody else has a chance to. And if you're a reporter, trust nobody. Um, very bottom line in all of this is got to be skeptical. You, you can't accept anything at face value that anybody tells you. There used to be an old adage in newspaper reporting that said, uh, trust no one, not even your mother, if she tells you she wants you find two other people to confirm that. And it was sort of a joke, but there's some truth to that. In this particular case, and we see this play out in a lot of different arenas and a lot of different ways is happening now with COVID-19. Um, when the government speaks in what is more or less one voice, um, you're probably not getting a full account of the story. And we're dealing with some of the repercussions of that now in terms of the advice being given about COVID-19 and uh, the need for testing and quarantine and intelligence to reopen. Uh, there's a lot of bad information flying around. Um, and, and that was the case in 1993, and it, it is today that, that much has been. And normally at this point, I would ask for questions, but obviously I'm not speaking directly to you, but if you have them, um, I teach at Baylor. I've been an adjunct for 25 years. I have an email address, uh, Richard Bradfield at Baylor, edu. And if you've got a question, send me an email, and I'd be happy to answer it. And with that, thank you for your time.